Okay, hello everyone. So today we're glad to have uh, Professor uh, uh, James Newton from uh, University of Oxford. The title is Symmetric Power Functionality for Model Forms. Please. Okay, hello. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak here, if only sort of remotely, but I hope to visit someday. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about some joint work with Jack Thorne on uh, symmetric power functionality for modular forms. So I, I sort of apologize right now if you saw some version of this talk last year. Um, this talk is like a little bit changed. It talks a little bit more about some of our more recent work, but uh, yeah, you'll see a lot of similarities if you did see me speak about this work before. So apologies for that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about symmetric power functionality. So I will begin by giving just a very brief introduction to a naive form of Langan's functoriality. And so I'm going to start with the following kind of setup. I'm going to have a number field F and a split reductive algebraic group over F, G. And then it has a Langan's dual group defined over complex numbers with the, uh, defined by looking at the dual root datum. And then I'm going to suppose I have a representation of that dual group. So this is a homomorphism R from G hat to GLN. But I can also think of a GLN over complex numbers as the dual group of GLN over F. So I'm sort of writing this in a slightly confusing way, but this is kind of a homomorphism from G hat to GLN over the complex numbers. And GLN over the complex numbers is the dual group of GLN over F. So we can actually think of this representation as a homomorphism between two Langlands dual groups. And then Langland's functoriality tells us that that homomorphism should give us a transfer from automorphic representations of G to automorphic representations of GLN. Uh, yeah, so that's what I've sort of written down here. If we have little pi, an automorphic representation of G would be a del's of F, then functoriality predicts that there should be an automorphic representation R pi of GLN would be a del's. Um, yeah, and since this is naive, I'm not going to say anything about packets or anything like that. I'm just going to sort of present it. Okay, and um, you know, given this prediction, we want to sort of say something about what this functorial transfer R pi should look like. And the place where you have a very natural description is at the um, finite places of F, where pi is unramified. So at all but finitely many places V of F. Pi V is an unramified representation uh, as invariants under a hyperspecial maximal compact. And then the Satake isomorphism tells us that those unramified representations are um, parameterized by semi simple conjugacy classes in the dual group. And so at each of these unramified places, Pi V, we get a Satake parameter called CV Pi. It's a semi simple conjugacy class in uh, the dual group. And now there's a very natural way to pass this to GLN. We just push forward this conjugacy class by our representation R. That gives us a semi-simple conjugacy class in GLN. And that should be the Satake parameter of our transferred automorphic representation at the place V. In particular, at the place V, this transfer should be unramified as well. And then the sort of example of a transfer that I'll talk about for the whole talk, basically, is um, this symmetric power homomorphism. So our group G will be GL2. Um, so this dual group is also GL2, with the complex numbers there. And then I'll look at the symmetric powers of the standard representation of GL2. That gives me an n plus one dimensional representation. And um, I'll be interested in symmetric power functionality, which is the, the Langlands transfer corresponding to this map of dual groups. Okay. Feel free to stop me at any point if there's questions. Oh, which reminds me, I should make the chat visible just in case. Okay, I now have a chat window visible as well. So if you put something in the chat, I might, I might notice it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me say a little bit more about what the symmetric power functionality looks like. So, now the setup is going to be, I'm always going to start with an automorphic representation of GL2 of the Adels of F. So we're just looking at this GL2 case. And then Langlands conjecture that we should have an automorphic representation for each n greater than equal to one. Uh, I'll call it sim n pi. 
the expectation of GLM plus one of the Adels of F. And it should be, um, we can characterize what its Satake parameters are from random up places. So I'll just write that down in a moment. Uh, here's the description of ramified places. So um, we have an automorphic representation of GL2. So locally, the uh, unramified representations are parameterized by the semi simple constant classes in GL2. Okay, so we just have a pair of elements. And just to go back to the most classical case, if the automorphic representation is generated by a cuspal Hecker eigenform, some weight and level, then the Satake parameter is given by looking at the roots of the Hecker polynomial. So for P not dividing the level of the modular form, that's going to be a prime where the uh, local factor of the automorphic representation is unramified. And the Satake parameter would be the roots of this polynomial where the sort of linear term is given by the Hecker eigenvalue of B. And I've got sort of a rescaling here because I want to make this Satake parameter unitary. So if you, if you sort of recall the Ramanujan Petterson conjecture, that will tell you that with these normalizations, my Satake parameter, this alpha p and this beta p, are actually uh, norm one complex numbers. Okay. And then to get the Satake parameter of the symmetric power, we just apply the symmetric power homomorphism to this semi-simple conjugacy class. And then we just get this diagonal element um, whose entries have a homogeneous degree n monomials in alpha and beta. Okay. So this is all just sort of setting up some notation. Uh, okay, so this is what my Satake parameters look like. And I'll just mention that we can also um, I said a few things about what happens at ramified places, but we can also pin down things at um, all the other places as well using local Langmans correspondence. So that means we can actually just write down what the local factor of our symmetric power lifting, sim n pi, should be for all places of B. So one way of sort of stating functionality conjecture in this case is, well, you know what these local factors should be. You take the restricted tensor product that gives you a representation of the adelic group GLM plus one the adels of f, and then the conjecture is that that adelic representation is actually an automorphic representation. Cool. Um, so now let me sort of reformulate this again in terms of L functions. Just kind of useful to to recall these classical things. So. And I've written down here the Satake parameters for my automorphic representation of GL2 and for the symmetric power lifting. And we can use those Satake parameters to write down um, at least the local factors at, at good primes for the L function of pi and its symmetric power lifting. Um, so here's what we get for pi. We have this degree two L function. Um, the local factors are just these product of two terms, one for each eigenvalue in the Satake parameter. And then there's sort of finally many factors at the ramified primes as well. But I'll just ignore those for now. Okay. And then without without knowing that um, without knowing the symmetric power functionality, we can still just write down um, an Euler product that should be giving us the L function of the symmetric power lifting. Um, we know what the local factors in that Euler product should be because we know what the Satake parameters are. Again, the good places we know that, and then if you want to extend to bad places, you can use this um, parameterization by local language. Okay, so there's some L functions, and as I said, you can write down this Euler product without knowing that symmetric power lifting uh, is an automorphic representation, and then the conje conjecture is going to predict that this L function is in fact an automorphic. And so that has very nice consequences because we know lots of things about automorphic L functions. We have some integral representations that allow us to actually prove things about automorphic L functions and then extract number theoretic consequences of that. Um, 
So it's sort of things that are nicest to state when the symmetric power lifting is cuspidal, which we'll end up assuming is the case anyway. So if that happens, then you get lots of nice results for this L function, just because it's the L function of a cuspidal automorphic representation of GLM plus one. Um, so let's see, you get results like analytic continuation of the L function to the whole complex plane and a functional equation, just generalizing the, the sort of results for the Riemann zeta function that we are all very familiar with. Um, you get a result about non vanishing on uh, the edge of a critical strip, real part of S equals one. So again, that's sort of similar to the non vanishing result for the Riemann zeta function that's used to prove the prime number theorem. Uh, somehow this is somewhat tangential, but I already mentioned ramanujian Peterson, which um, predicts that the Satake parameters should be unitary, words that alpha v and beta v have complex absolute value one. Um, of course, this was proven in certain cases by Deline and not known in general in this setting. For example, I'm including things coming from mass forms where you don't know this, this conjecture. But um, Langland's pointed out that if you uh, knew symmetric power functoriality and full generality, then you'd be able to um, prove the ramanujan Pedersen conjecture using kind of weaker bounds on the um, complex absolute values of the Satake parameters for the symmetric power lifting. There's this thing called the, uh, what's it called? Deline Langland's method or something, but Tensor product trick. That's what serality number is called. Maybe Rankin. Yeah, Rankin should be mentioned for sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, anyway, the main re reason I was mentioning Ramanujan Peterson is that once you sort of know these Satake parameters are sort of living in the unitary group, then you can ask how they're sort of distributed inside this compact Lie group. And that's the subject of the Sato Tate conjecture. Uh, so that I mean, there's some issues about sort of central characters, but essentially it says that these Satake parameters are equidistributed um, according to Haar measure in this unit. Uh, and and Sarah explained how to to prove that using non-vanishing results uh, like those of Jacques and Schleicher for these automorphic L functions. Um, so this is a very nice kind of arithmetic consequence about uh, just about the automorphic representation of GL2, you have the distribution of these uh, star k parameters, or in the word of modular forms, you're just asking for some information about the distribution of Hecker eigenvalues. That's, that's the prime P there is for a single modular form. Um, and this arithmetic information follows from symmetric power functorality and these non-vanishing results of the, of the L function at the edge of a critical strip. Okay, so this is uh, cool stuff that you get once you prove that these L functions are automatic. Okay, um, are there any questions at this point? This was all kind of some kind of very rapid introduction to quite a sort of classical thing, but it's just to give a kind of introduction to this problem of symmetric power functionality. The next thing I'm going to do is um, recall sort of past results on symmetric power function reality. Okay. Um, so these are the kind of main results that are known uh, in the generality I'm working so far. So I had this sort of arbitrary number field F and I was looking at cuspidal automorphic representations of GL2 of the L's at F with no kind of algebraicity here, assumption or anything like that. So I was including things coming from non-holomorphic mass forms, working over arbitrary number fields. Um, so um, back in the seventies, existence of the uh, symmetric square lifting was proved. And then much later, Kim and Shahidi proved the existence of a symmetric cube and fourth power. And um, these results are proved using converse met theorems. That's sort of one of the few robust methods we have for proving that, uh, uh, for establishing language of reality. Uh, of course, to apply a converse theorem, you have to get some control over um, the L functions. So you have to get, to get some control over your symmetric power L function, things like this. Uh, this is done using the language Shahidi method, so this work of Kim Shahidi. 
And yeah, as I already mentioned, these results are completely general. The GL2 over arbitrary number field. Um, and to go further, I'm going to have to specialize more to the world of uh, what are called algebraic automorphic representations. By the way, James, so in these cases, they are all cosmic, right? Um, let's see. I mean, I was assuming pi was cuspidal, just for convenience. And then the symmetric square, um, I mean, it doesn't have to be cuspidal. If pi had CN, then the symmetric square can be uh, non cuspidal. Okay. Yeah. So um, when you start, in a moment, I'll come to the Gawa side. I mean, it's kind of, once you're working with Gawa representations, it's easy to tell whether you're going to be cuspidal or not because you just look at whether the Gawa representation is irreducible or not. Then you apply the symmetric power homomorphism. So you are saying the lifting of this uh, cuspidal may not be cuspid. That's right. That's right. Okay. okay. Right. So yeah, I just mentioned Gauss representations, and, and that's why I'm going to put myself in this world of algebraic automorphic representations. I want to use methods involving Gauss representations. So. Um, I mean, without giving a sort of general definition of this algebraic notion, it's due to uh, Clausel for the case of GLN. Um, I'm going to assume that F is a totally real field and pi is a cohomological cuspidal automorphic representation of GL2 of the Adels of F. So in sort of classical terms, that basically means that pi is generated by a holomorphic Hilbert modular form um, where the sort of weights are at least two in the sort of classical way of normalizing these things. Um, so what this word cohomological means is that I can sort of detect the Hecker eigenvalues for this automorphic representation um, by looking at the action of the Hecker algebra on the cohomology of a, a locally symmetric space, in this case, a Hilbert modular variety with coefficients in some kind of automorphic local system that depends on the, the weight of the modular form or in automorphic language, it depends on the, the um, local factor at the Archimedean place of the, modular, of the automorphic representation. Okay, but in any case, there's some link with arithmetic geometry because you have Hilbert modular varieties there. Um, in fact, in practice, it's useful to sort of use the Jacques Langlands correspondence and move to a quaternion algebra. But in any case, um, using these connections with arithmetic geometry, it's possible to construct Gower representations associated to these automorphic representations. So um, and these Gower representations come in what are called compatible systems. So that means for each prime p and for each. Uh, isomorphism iota from complex numbers to an algebraic closure of pielic numbers, you get a Gower representation. And it's a continuous representation of the absolute Gower group of the number field F. Um, and that Gower group is acting on a two-dimensional vector space over a pielic field. You get this homomorphism to GL2 of this pielic field. And its relationship to the automorphic representation is given by matching up um, the Sotake parameter, that's an unramified place B. So remember that is a semi-simple conjugacy class in GL2C. CV pi is a semi-simple conjugacy class in GL2C. The reason why I had to fix this isomorphism iota is because I want to think of that conjugacy class actually as being something piadic. So I have to apply iota to it. That gives me a semi-simple conjugacy class in GL2 QP bar. And sort of Roughly speaking, that conjugate class should be the same as the conjugate class of the image of a Frobenius element in this Galois group under the Galois representation. Um, so that's just sort of approximate because I have this issue about there's some issue about normalizations. That's one thing, and also I might have to pass to the like semi-simple part of this image of Frobenius. So in general, we expect the image of Frobenius to um, be given by a semi-simple element of this of this group, but uh, we don't know that in general. But um, at least the characteristic polynomial of this Frobenius element will match the characteristic polynomial of this uh, Sotake parameter. Uh, yeah. Okay, so again, the most classical case, just go back to Hecker eigenforms, some weight and level. Um, and then for primes L away from the level and also the, the prime P when I'm looking for pialic Gower representation, then what this sort of, um, characterization of the Gower representation says is just that the characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius element at L 
is this Hecker polynomial I wrote down before when I was talking about Satake parameters. So in particular, it's the, the trace of the um, action of Frobenius in this two-dimensional Garrett's notation is equal to the um, Hecker eigenvalue for the Hecker operator there. And um, well, I didn't say things about sort of the Langs group and global Langs parameters, but um, in this kind of algebraic case, this Gower representation plays the role of a global Langs parameter. And that means it's very easy to interpret what Langs functionality does on the side of Gower representation. By the way, James, so yeah. if, if V uh, is amplified and equal to P, do we have a condition? Mm, um, yeah, I mean, then you need to do some more work, but you can you can say things exactly. So, um, so in, in arithmetic geometry, when you're looking at sort of the piadic et al. cohomology of a of a variety over a piadic field, um, well, if L is not equal to P, if you look at L adic cohomology of a variety over a piadic field, uh, when variety has good reduction at P, this L adic representation is unramified. So that's kind of where the unramifiedness appears in this when you sort of attach Gower representation as geometric thing. Um, in this sort of L equals P case, the right notion is to talk about a, a crystalline Gower representation. So you use ideas from piadic quantitative. And, and you can then sort of describe a compatibility between the Gower representation and the automorphic representation using uh, piadic quantitative. But it's, it's a bit more involved. Yeah. The Gower representation, you should not, it, it won't be unramified in general. But the Gower representation won't be unramified, even if the automorphic representation is. Okay. The um, the tilde is um, fact. You're also including the, the normalization in there. Yeah, I'm I'm just sweeping everything. Yeah, there's some normalization, and then there's semi simplification, and then there's conjug conjugacy. Basically, whatever you want is is described by this tilde. Okay. Um, all right. So we have this Langs parameter, and how do we think about Langs functoriality on the Galois side? Well, as I said, it's quite easy. You just um, we have our homomorphism dual groups. We can, if you like, we can use our isomorphism iota to think of this as a homomorphism between piadic groups. Then just try writing a little bit. I can oops, compose my two dimensional Gauss representation with this symmetric power homomorphism to get an n plus one dimensional Gauss representation just by composition. And now, from the point of view of Gauss representations, what Langs functionality is predicting is that this n plus one dimensional Gauss representation uh, comes from an automorphic representation, is associated to an automorphic representation. So I'm just going to say a little, a few more words what that means here. Fortunately, this annotation will disappear. Um, Right, so now this functionality conjecture becomes the statement that this n plus one dimensional Gauss representation is automorphic, which means that there exists an automorphic representation of GL, L, GLN plus one of the Adelzer, such that the image of the Verbenius element under this uh, symmetric power Gauss representation matches up with the Satake parameters of this uh, automorphic representation. And you could also sort of say what well, this meant in terms of L functions as well, that the N plus one dimensional Gauss representation has an L function associated to it. It's the same L function I wrote down before with the Satake parameter for GLN plus one appearing as the local factor. And you could ask to that L function to be an automorphic L function. Okay. So, to prove this conjecture, we just have to prove that certain Gauss representations are automorphic. And yeah, just notationally, when you have this sort of relationship between a normal representation pi 
and a gamma representation. Um, that means that gamma representation is sort of isomorphic to the, the gamma representation associated to pi. So there's sort of a very um, big piece of work by many people which constructs gamma representations for uh, automorphic representations of, uh, of these groups. I mean, in fact, it's known without a self duality condition, but these in the symmetric power case, these automorphic representations will satisfy some self duality condition. So this kind of construction of gamma representations uh, was known quite a few years ago. Okay. Right, so let me talk about what's known in this sort of algebraic setting using methods from gamma representations. So I'll just to remind you of your setup, I basically have something coming from the Hilbert modular form. And um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, I'm going to put myself in a situation where if um, these symmetry power liftings exist, then they have to be cuspidal. So we can do that on the Gawa side by ensuring that these symmetric power Gawa representations are irreducible. And um, that will be the case if, if the sort of, uh, if a two-dimensional representation as uh, as a risky dense image in GL two, and it's a theorem of, uh, of Ribbit, I guess, so that, that that's true when this uh, Hilbert modular form is not CN, so it doesn't appear as an automorphic induction from a uh, Hecker character of a quadratic extension. Of the total. Okay. Um, so with this setup, um, here's a theorem of Bunnett, Lamb, G, and Garrity which builds on earlier work of Gazelle, Harris, and Baron and Taylor. Um, so they proved a result which is usually called um, potential automorphism. So they proved that these symmetric power Gauer representations become automorphic when you restrict to the absolute Gauer group of some auxiliary uh, extension field. So they don't quite prove uh, what is predicted by Langens, that, that this symmetric power Gauer representation is um, automorphic. They have to make this uh, uh, extension of the base field, but after that they, they get something automatic. And you don't have, I mean, you can you can place some restrictions on this uh, extension field, but you don't have too much control on it. And also this this extension field uh, depends on n. So as you go to sort of bigger and bigger symmetric powers, it, so naively I would just expect you'd have to sort of choose a bigger and bigger extension. You sort of go through that method. Um, so this is a little bit weaker than Langer's functionality, but uh, it still has some very important consequences because uh, Taylor already noticed in the two-dimensional case that this kind of potential automorphy told you that uh, sort of relevant L functions have a meromorphic continuation to the whole complex. You basically use uh, Brouwer's induction theorem to write this uh, L function as a kind of uh, a, a rational function of L functions, of automorphic L functions. Okay, anyway, you, it's enough to give you meromorphic continuation to complex plane and a functional equation for this symmetric power L function, which is nice. And then even nicer, you get a non vanishing result on uh, the edge of a critical strip. And that was enough to prove the Sato Tate conjecture for Hilbert modular form. So this is a very nice, very general result, but it falls a little bit short of, of, of what was predicted by Langer's functionality because of this uh, passing to this extension field. Um, and well, one could ask, well, maybe with, with this as a starting point, then we could try and sort of descend this automorphic representation pi to an automorphic representation of GLM plus one of Kiddells of F, the smaller field. Um, that kind of descent is possible when this extension is uh, solvable, but it seems very, very difficult in general. And um, there's no reason why you would expect these extensions to be solvable uh, in general. By the way, James, so the, all these consequences has nothing to do with F prime. I mean, right? let's see. Uh, Hmm. 
I mean, F prime some, plays some role. Basically, you, what happens is you write, you write this, this L function, you end up writing it as um, a fraction where the numerator and denominator are products of automorphic L functions for automorphic representations over F prime. So this is not the original F function? I mean, no, I mean, it's not, the com is it, is it complete F function? Know, yep, this is the original of... one, but then kind of you, you sort of prove things about this L function using, but, using information about so the L functions. Original one, but this original one only defined, uh, I mean, partially. So is it complete L function? Oh, I see what you mean when I define. Well, I, I gave this definition where I just wrote down the, the good factors, but yeah, I, I sort of, I wanted to include the bad factors as well. I just didn't want to write them down on the slide. So ramified also had they fund? There, there were also ramified local factors in, in those L functions, but I didn't write down what they were. I just left a sort of space where they should have been. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe it doesn't make so much difference to, I mean, it would sort of, mess up the functional equation to some extent, but it doesn't affect things like non-vanishing or meromorphic continuation because this finite number of local factors doesn't, doesn't really change those properties. So um, definition of this complete function, namely the ramified factors. So is it fully defined for any cuspidal or, or so, so uh, only for this cohomology cuspidal defined complete function? Oh, um, I think, I mean, if you, if you, Use the local language correspondence. Oh, yeah, yeah. you sure. know what all the local yeah, factors yeah. should okay. be, and then you know what the, the alpha yeah. should be. All right, thank you. Yeah, this is the GLN, the everything. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we're all defined, right? The yeah. Alpha function. Mm. Thanks. Okay. Great. So now I'll move on to talk about uh, automorphy without this potential work. So, really, automorphy over the field. <clears throat> So the kind of first results I know of on this beyond uh, Kim and Shahidi's work are those of Clazell and Thorne. And they, in a series of papers, prove automorphic symmetric powers up to the eighth symmetric power. Um, and they use sort of, their methods are of course related to the kind of automorphic lifting theorems that appear in the, in the, in the theorem on this slide, but um, they use kind of different kinds of automorphic lifting theorems and it doesn't really depend on this, this earlier theorem. And I'll say a tiny bit about their, their method because it will appear again later when I talk about um, our more recent work. So they exploit reducibility of symmetric power representations in small characteristics. So now if we look at sort of mod P things, if we look at uh, symmetric powers of the standard representation of GL2 over this positive characteristic field, and that's actually reducible as soon as the, as soon as the power is at least P. So now when you look at what happens to the symmetric power gauge representations, um, that means um, they have they have sort of reductions mod P. So you can, starting from one of these chaotic gauge representations, you can reduce it and get some semi-simple representation um, with coefficients in FP bar. And when we apply the symmetric power homomorphism, we get a reducible gauge representation just because of this reducibility of the, of the, of the representation. And so that means you can then kind of do some sort of induction on the size of your, of your gauge on the dimension of your gauge representation. This reducible representation breaks up into a few different pieces. It's usually two pieces in their argument. And if you can show each of those two pieces comes from an automorphic representation, then you can hope to, um, well, then you do get a congruence between your symmetric power gauge representation and an automorphic gauge representation. then you can hope to apply an automorphic lifting theorem, an automorphic lifting theorem that precisely sort of propagates automorphy along these congruences. So starting from this automorphic gauge representation, you have this congruence to your symmetric power gauge representation. If you have the right kind of automorphic lifting theorem, you can prove automorphy of this. So in this case, you have to use the automorphic lifting theorem with the residual representation is reducible. Exactly, yeah. You have to use automorphic lifting theorems with a residual, uh, a reducible residual representation. These are very delicate things, and and here they used um, sort of 
results that were due to, to Thorne generalizing Skinner Wiles's results. And then the, these results get refined a bit in some of these papers of Cazelle and Thorne. Um, but the whole thing is quite delicate. So this is just a very sort of brief introduction to the idea behind their work. Okay. So why, why uh, there is eight? Yeah, why eight? That's a good question. Maybe right at the end, I'll explain why this is. But th there's also, um, so I mentioned, yeah, this representation is reducible. I mean, you need to show that sort of each of the factors in this representation are um, automorphic. And when you look at the way these symmetric power representations break up into reducibles, they, you get sort of tensor products of smaller dimensional representations. So to show automorphy of each of the, of the factors of this reducible representation, you actually need to use some kind of tensor product functionality. Um, so there's some, in fact, what they, what they prove is that there's some implications between tensor product functionality and symmetric power functionality. So if you knew sort of enough tensor product functionality, they would actually prove symmetric power functionality in general. Um, but with what we, we do know about tensor product functionality, they just get up to this eight symmetric power. Okay, so now I'll get to the main theorem and I'll specialize even further actually. So before I was talking about Hilbert modular forms, and now I'm just gonna sort of go back to the most classical elliptic modular forms. So my base number theorem is gonna be the rational numbers. Pi is going to be in one of these cuspidal cohomological to morph representations of GL2. It bells at the rationals now. So up to twist, I'm just looking at things coming from cuspidal Heckweig forms, holomorphic of some weight, at least two. And then uh, our, our theorem from last year is that uh, all of the symmetric powers are automorphic for these uh, cuspidal Heckweig forms with the rational numbers. And um, yeah, I mean, this result is proved in the sort of two main papers from myself and Fawn, but we use um, joint work with uh, Patrick Allen, which proves a um, automorphy lifting theorem for residually reducible Gauss representations. This is exactly the kind of theorem Tong was uh, asking about. Um, and then there's also work of Christos Anastasiades and Fawn. So this is essentially um, Anastasiades' thesis. Um, so that provides another essential increase. And well, a tiny bit of history. In sort of 2019, we proved this theorem when uh, under some sort of ramification hypothesis. So when pi has no supercustable local factors. Um, in particular, that includes the case where the, the level of the modular form is square free. Uh, and then there was a sort of new argument which uh, handles the general case without this assumption. And then, uh, well, a tiny bit about applications. I already told you that potential automorphy was enough to prove the sato take conjecture. Um, you get a little bit more information from uh, knowing automorphy. So if you really have an automorphic representation for GLM plus one over the rationals. Um, there's some works on this uh, most recently by Fauna, I think, which prove a kind of more effective version of the sato take conjecture. So, so to take a is some kind of equidistribution statement. So it says in a limit, two measures coincide, an empirical measure and a, a Sato tape measure. Um, you could try and get a slightly more refined statement and try and bound the discrepancy between those two measures. Um, so that would be the sort of error term in the Sato tape conjecture, the, the difference between what Sato tape measure predicts and what you actually see for where the Satake parameters lie inside your, uh, inside your unitary group. Yeah, so there's some results on this uh, most recently due to form, which use this um, symmetric power functionality. Okay. Um, so let's see, how long have I got? About 20 minutes. So I'll kind of just give a very high level overview of the strategy to prove this theorem, and then I'll make some remarks about the various parts of the strategy. Okay, so the strategy is in sort of four pieces. <clears throat> um, and the first piece is um, well, called seed points. So that gives us somewhere to get started with in our arguments. So 
we prove that for every n, there's at least one level one cuspidal Hecker eigenform uh, with a automorphic nth symmetric power. And I should say this is not at all, uh, our methods are not at all sort of effective. Like we can't, if you tell me what's your level one eigenform that has a automorphic 20th symmetric power, I'm not sure I would be able to, yeah. not sure I would be able to tell you the answer. Um, okay. But that gives us some place to start off with. And then we want some kind of method to spread out. So we know that we have these examples of modular forms with automorphic symmetric powers. We want to spread out to more examples. And the way we spread out is by using piadic families of modular forms. So here's a kind of vague version. If we have two cusp Lecker eigenforms, F and G, of the same level N, but they could have different weights. That's kind of crucial for us. Uh, if you can connect them with a irreducible in sort of sense of algebraic geometry, piadic family of modular forms. So I'll make this more precise in a later slide, but if you can connect them by a family of piadic modular forms, then um, we show that one of these eigenforms has an automorphic empty symmetric power, if and only if the other does. And then, well, we have a place to start and we have a, a method to kind of spread out automorphy of symmetric powers to more Hecker eigenforms. So then the, the next step in the strategy is to use those two ingredients to prove that every level one Hecker eigenform has an automorphic empty symmetric power. So we call this ping pong because there's some kind of game we have to play to use these things to propagate automorphic symmetric powers to all the level one eigenforms. And well, the original version of this game involved lots of bouncing back and forth, but when it eventually got written up, it actually doesn't involve much bouncing at all. So it's a very short game of ping pong in the end. Okay, so after we've done those three steps, then we've sort of shown this symmetric power form neutrality for level one Hecker eigenforms. And the, the final step is a kind of induction on the level of the modular forms. And so, so it reduces the general case to level one. And, it, and that also uses this propagation of chaotic families ingredient. All right, so I will say a little bit about maybe A and B and D. I think that's my plan for the last bit. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so first of all, let me briefly talk about A. So that's producing some examples of Hecker eigenforms with automorphic symmetric powers. So this is the part of the argument that's most closely related to Clausel and Fawn's previous work. Um, so they use the sort of reducibility of certain Gower representations in small characteristics. We have a bit more flexibility here because we're allowed to choose our Hecker eigenform F. We're just going to prove a statement about the existence of a single Hecker eigenform with an automorphic symmetric power. And I'm sort of simplifying a bit, but roughly speaking, the idea is to choose F to be congruent to a CM form modulo some prime P. So in fact, that's not quite what we do. There's some intermediate form that's congruent to the CM form that has some maybe higher level, and then we use another congruence to get to our level one form. But anyway, so suppose we were congruent to this CM form. Well, that means that because the Gower representation of the CM form is, is induced from a character of the imaginary quadratic extension, the, the CM field, um, if you have this congruence, then the mod P Gower representation for F is also induced from a character of an index two subgroup. And so that means that the mod P symmetric power Gower representations uh, are going to be, become reducible. This is just a nice elementary Greek theory exercise. If you look at one of these induced representations, start taking symmetric powers, it will decompose into one and two dimensional pieces. So then we can apply an argument like Clausel and Fawn did. We have an automorphic representation. In this case, it's not cuspidal, who's associated mod P Gower representation, it's this reducible symmetric power representation. Then we can apply an automorphic lifting theorem. Residually reducible Gower representation. Um, 
but I mentioned earlier, these automorphic listening theorems are quite delicate. So you have to, before you can apply that, you have to first show some level raising congruences. So you have to produce a congruence between this automorphic representation pi and some cuspidal pi prime that has suitable ramification at some auxiliary place. So this, this sort of level raising step in its own is actually very involved. So part of that comes from the work of uh, Anastasiades in his PhD thesis that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then there's another result that relies on the existence of unipotent cuspidal representations for finite unitary groups in three directions. So there's a sort of yeah, quite delicate argument in here that's actually just used to sort of verify some technical condition for the automorphic lifting theorem. But having done that, we, we do produce these examples of level one eigenforms with automorphic symmetry. Um, to get uh, that Simen Robar's modular for some cuspidal thing, do you just multiply by some kind of Haas invariant or something like that? Mm. No. <laughs> um, if we could, that would be great. Uh, or, or do you require that at some point that it's automorphic for something cuspidal? Well, we we prove that, and because the thing is, actually, we need it to be automorphic for something cuspidal that also has Steinberg ramification at some auxiliary place. Um, I, see, I see. So once you've once you've got the Steinberg ramification, you know it has to be cuspidal anyway. Thanks. Okay. So I'll, I'll briefly say something about B, and I'll just give a sort of more precise statement of this propagation in periodic families result. Um, mostly just to sort of tell you the kind of periodic families I'm looking at. So, and the kind of periodic families they are is they're sort of subspaces of the common maze of Eichen curves. So if you have a level N and a prime P that doesn't divide N, then you have this nice sort of object in periodic geometry constructed by Coleman, Mazer, and um, Buzzard actually in the generality and writing things here. Um, and it's a periodic analytic space. It's a, it's a curve, it's a dimension one. And it kind of interpolates Hecker eigenforms together with a little bit of extra data at the prime p. So this curve contains a dense set of points corresponding to pairs f and alpha p, where f is a Hecker eigenform. And alpha p is one of the entries in this Satake parameter, which I've mentioned a few times. So each modular form of level n prime to p is going to give me two points on this eigen curve, um, one for alpha p, one for beta p. And actually, there's a slightly more general family of classical points where the level is allowed to be a modular p as well. But I won't go into that in more detail. And kind of one nice way to think about the geometry of this curve is to think about uh, the map to weight space, which sort of controls how the weights of the modular forms vary in the periodic terms. So this weight space parameterizes periodic characters of ZP star. And if I had a classical point, so coming from one of these eigenforms F in the eigen curve, and its image in the weight space is, uh, you can just write down what it is in terms of the weights of the modular form. So it's basically given by the, if the weight is K, then you just look at the sort of case power map. That's the character of ZP star. Okay, and then the sort of precise statement we prove is that if you have two classical points of this eigen curve, so both of these classical points come with a, a modular form and one of these sort of choices of eigenvalues in the Satake parameter, so you have f and f p and second one f prime and f prime p. There are two points of this of this periodic analytic curve and if they lie in a common irreducible component, so I sort of think about it saying you can connect these two points by an irreducible family, if they lie in a common irreducible component then modulo a couple of technical hypotheses you can transfer automorphic of symmetric powers from one of these modular forms to the other. All right, so that's a more st precise statement of this periodic propagation.
So that's the sort of main tool we use to show automorphic symmetric powers for level one eigenvalues. Um, let's see. The next slide is like a bit more information about how we how we do that. But let me kind of skim over this because I wanted to say a little bit about this final killing ramification step. So let me just mention that we have to we have this result that tells us that we can propagate automorphic symmetric powers along irreducible components of the eigen curve. So to really extract information from this, we need to know something about the geometry of the eigen curve. And um, to do that, we sort of specialize to prime two P equals two and the tame level one eigen curve. And then we use a very nice theorem of puzzled and Kilford that sort of completely explicitly describes the geometry of that, of that curve um, over some big region in the weight space, over sort of what's called a boundary annulus in the weight space. So they don't quite explicitly describe this curve in its entirety, but they describe enough of it that we can use this propagation step to prove automorphy of symmetric powers for level one. Okay, so we have to use this sort of very small prime at the end to, to finish this argument. I did think it was useful to, to explain why we have to look at p equals two. So in all of these propagation steps, the, the mod p gamma representation is fixed. So if we have two eigenforms with two different mod p gamma representations, we can't connect between them using our periodic propagation. But the nice thing is that the tape proved in this mod two case and tame level one, there's only one possible gamma representation that can appear. So if you have a semi-simple mod two representation of the absolute gamma group of Q, and if it's unramified outside two, then it has to be the trivial representation. So that means that every point of this two adic tame level one eigen curve has the same mod two gamma representation. So actually it's even possible that this eigen curve is irreducible, which, and then our sort of propagation in irreducible families would immediately tell us that if one classical point on this eigen curve has an automorphic symmetric power, then all the classical points do. Uh, yeah, actually, we don't know this, but Buzzard and Kilford's result gives us enough information to, to carry out the argument anyway. Okay, so finally I want to talk about killing ramification, and this is about going from general level and reducing to the case of level one. And the idea is very similar to how Karin van der Berger proved Sayers conjecture in general. Um, it simply had a sort of reduction to the case of level one. And so in particular, we induct on the number of primes dividing the level of our Hecker eigenform. So we're gonna let P be a prime dividing the level of F. And actually there's two different cases depending on the kind of ramification you have at P. If you have a non-supercuspal ramification, you can use the piadic propagation result that I stated uh, to reduce to the case of a modular form with um, where you divide out p from the level. This is what we mean by sort of killing ramification. Um, so, so more precisely, if you have this non-supercuspal ramification at p, you can connect your eigenform f to another eigenform f prime with level prime to p in a p adic eigen curve. And then this, this form with level prime to p, we're doing some induction on the number of primes level, dividing the level. So by our inductive hypothesis, we know automorphy of the nth symmetric power of this f prime. And the p adic propagation result gives us automorphy of the symmetric power of f. So that's sort of how we handle non-supercuspital ramification. It involves this periodic propagation step, which we already needed to apply in the case of level one eigenforms. Um, so that just leaves the case where you have primes where the ramification is supercuspital. So that's where the local factor of the automorphic representation is supercuspital. So let me say a little bit about that. Again, we want to sort of induct on the number of primes dividing the level. So we want to kind of deduce uh, automorphy of the symmetric power of F from automorphy of a symmetric power for some different eigenform that doesn't have supercuspital ramification P. 
And the nice thing is we can always find a, a congruence, a mod p congruence to a eigenform that's non supercapacitor p. Um, sort of example of a sort of well known fact is that uh, up to twist every mod p system of Hecker eigenvalues appears at wake two and level gamma one pn, some n co prime to p. So, in particular, modular forms of these levels uh, don't have supercuspital ramification at p. They're either principal series or twist of Steinberg at p. So, that means you always have a congruence like this. And so, then again, we're sort of seeking an automorphy lifting theorem, which is going to allow us to propagate automorphy from one of these symmetric powers to the other. Um, the tricky thing is that uh, you have this issue, which was actually very useful for Clausel and Thorne. Um, this mod p Garrett's notation might be reducible. So if the prime p is smaller than the, than the power n, then this mod p Garrett's notation will always be reducible. So to, to propagate automorphy here, you would need some kind of automorphy lifting theorem for re residually reducible Garrett's notations. And um, existing results like that are not enough to, to handle this. So in, in particular, in most of the automorphy lifting theorems proved for residually reducible things work in just the ordinary case. This is sort of experts who know about this thing. And uh, we're looking at sort of supercuspidal primes. So F is certainly non-ordinary at P. So um, results of sort of Skinner Wars and then Fawn and then my work with if Alan and Fawn will never, will never handle these kinds of uh, automorphic results, which we need. So to handle this, we, we proved a new kind of automorphic lifting theorem adapted to this context. And it's one that kind of crucially uses the fact that you have this pair of modular forms, F and G, and then you're looking at symmetric powers. So I'll say a tiny bit more about this. So I'll call it a relative modularity lifting theorem because it really uses the fact that you already have sort of two modular things for GL2 and a congruence between them. And you're trying to lift modularity uh, under some homomorphism of the Langlands tree. So yeah, let me finish by just sort of stating a theorem and then making a couple of remarks about it. So, let me just show you these conditions and run through them a little bit. So we've got two Hecker eigenforms, F and G. We've got a prime P. And as before, I've got an integer N. I'm going to be looking at N symmetric powers. And I've got one of these isomorphisms from pianic numbers to the contact numbers. And so now I'm going to assume that we have a congruence between F and G. Another way of saying that is that mod P Garrett's notations are isomorphic. And I'm going to assume, as I have before, that F and G don't have CM. So we always have kind of irreducible um, periodic Garrett notations. And I'm going to assume that we're in this non ordinary setting. So that means that neither of the Hecker eigenvalues at P are periodic units for F and G. OK, I mean, I need a little bit of an assumption on the image of the mod P Garrett representation to know that it contains some quite big subgroup. And then there's an extra condition. And then there's the sort of crucial input that we have some kind of automorphic result. We know that the symmetric nth symmetric power for G is automorphic. Oops. And then the conclusion is that the nth symmetric power for F is automorphic. Um, so that's a statement. And so the main novelty in here is that, that this representation is residually reducible. Um, but we have this non-ordinary assumption here. So there are some, not many results known about automobile lifting for residual reducible representations, and they usually assume you have ordinary things. And maybe I'll use like one minute just to make some comments on this, on the proof of this theorem. Um, so like all modularity lifting theorems, we use the, the Taylor Wiles method to prove this. Um, we're using this method as adapted by Kissin. So that means you're sort of pre presenting global Gower deformation. 
ramification rings over local ground deformation rings, and then allowing ramifications or auxiliary sets of primes. So the new thing is that we, we avoid sort of trying to apply this patching to the n plus one dimensional representation. That's something that's very difficult to do because these representations are reducible and the deformation theory is very tricky. And so this is kind of very difficult. Instead, we apply the, the sort of patching method just to the, the two dimensional world, the place where we have our modular forms and two dimensional gap representations. And we just kind of do something compatible for the n plus one dimensional things. Um, that um, for the people who know about tail, the Taylor-Wise method, we don't attempt to sort of uh, to to kill off the dual Selmer group, the n plus one dimensional gap representation. So instead, we just do something that's compatible with what we're doing in the two dimensional world. And then there's some arguments involving Galois cohomology that always appear in the Taylor-Wise method, um, and, and using these sort of dual Selmer groups I just mentioned. Um, and we, we use those arguments for the two-dimensional representations, but we don't use them for the n plus one dimensional representation. Instead, they get replaced by a, kind of, a, a, sort of a different result on vanishing of an adjoint Selma group for this n plus one dimensional representation in characteristic zero. And yeah, got this, this vanishing result, we also prove using the taylor wiles method. So the taylor wiles method appears in about I, I sort of didn't say anything about it in detail, but it appears in like six different places in the work I'm describing in various different guises. Okay, but right, we, we're able to use this vanishing result of an adjoint summer group to, to replace a certain part of the, the usual Taylor Wiles argument. Okay, and then just the sort of high level comment is the, the picture of how this theorem is proved. Is actually very similar to how the propagation in Piatic families result that I stated is proved. So I didn't tell you anything about the proof of this, but uh, yes, it's actually similar. So in the propagation in Piatic families, we're kind of allowing ramification of the prime P. That's what happens when we look at sort of families of Piatic modular forms and Piatic characterizations associated to them. And in that result, we then use again this vanishing and adjoint sum of the group to control the geometry of some. Uh, spaces of Gower representations, periodic Gower representations. This modularity lifting theorem is proved in a sort of formally similar way, but now we're doing the Taylor Wiles method, so we're allowing ramification of auxiliary primes instead of the prime. Right? So these auxiliary sets of Taylor Wiles primes we allow ramification. But uh, you know, if you sort of write down th th things down in an analogous way, you can make the proofs of these two results look quite similar. So they're kind of a People sometimes talk about vertical Iwasawa theory, which is the usual Iwasawa theory, and horizontal Iwasawa theory, which is the Taylor Wiles method. So these two results, the propagation in Piatic families and, and, and this kind of relative modularity lifting theorem, they're kind of vertical and horizontal versions of the same idea. Okay, I'm done. Thanks very much. Nice talk. Let's thanks, James. Any questions? Um, are there any hypotheses on um, F and F prime in the Piatic um, interpolation argument, like some kind of large image hypothesis specifically? Ah, yeah, good question. So uh, a hypothesis we, I don't know why I'm going through the slides. I don't really need to. Um, or maybe I'll just bring up the statement. Just, uh, Here's the same. Yeah. Um, we do not need to assume that mod p Garrett citations have a large image in this statement. That would be a disaster because we want to use this like p equals two tame level one case where all the mod p representations are trivial. Um, we do need to know that the, the piadic representations have large image. But because we're always looking at sort of non CM forms and we can just avoid, we basically avoid CM forms everywhere in this part of the argument. Um, so that means all of the Piatic Gauss representations will have large image. Uh, but is, so is that a? Um... So it, it is it is one of the technical hypotheses, but that's kind of that's maybe the, the, an easier one to check in practice mm -hmm. because we just won't won't care about the CM forms. But you you only need. Um... 
uh, you only need large image for f and not like sim nf because that will typically be small. Um, what else? I mean, well, it will typically be small, but I mean, it, it will have large image in the sense, I mean, it won't have the risky dense image in GL n plus one, um, but it will have the kind of things you need for the, the Taylor Wiles method, or at least a characteristic zero analog of that. So you'll be able to find um, regular semi simple elements in the image of the, of the, of the Carroll expectation. Um, but did, I mean, did you say that it, it will be? Um... Did you say it would be irreducible in general? Or, oh, sorry, um, reducible? This Pianic representation, it will be irreducible. It will be irreducible. Larger with a non CM form. As long as it's non CM. Okay. Yeah, because the two dimensional representation has the risky dense image in GL2, and mm. the symmetric power representations are irreducible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the main technical hypothesis is to do with um, I mean, something that usually gets called regularity. So, one thing you want to, to assume is that alpha p is not equal to beta p. But then actually you want the sort of similar statement for um, the Satake parameter for GLM plus one. So you want all of those sort of things like alpha p to the n, alpha p to the n minus one beta p, and to beta p to the n. You want all of those elements to be distinct. And this is something you can actually check for the p equals two tame level one case. You can check that those sort of two adic Satake parameters are always going to have this kind of regularity. Mm -hmm. Um, but in general, we have to use the Taylor Wiles method again, in fact, to, to, to put us in a situation where we can verify this technical hypothesis. I think that's the seventh time the Taylor Wiles method appears in the proof. Now, no questions? Oh, I have a question. So for your modularity lifting theorem, so is it possible to uh, have a stronger form that uh, Assume that only have a PID color representation, residually is uh, uh, modular, and then post some uh, local condition. Is that hope that uh, you can just make um, to make it then you can claim that the representation is holomorphic? So, what I'm trying to say that without assume F is actually come from the hack eigen form, you just know that it's some kind of color representations. Oh, excellent question. And the answer is no, absolutely not. So it's crucial for our method that we have this, we have F and G and modular forms. We already know modularity for GL2. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I mean, of course, it, but I mean, maybe, but often you can prove modularity lifting theorems for the two dimensional representation, right? So if you can apply a, a modularity lifting theorem for that two dimensional representation, then. Yeah, so, so basically, I mean. As well. So actually, maybe the answer to your question is yes, because, but, but then, but it's sort of, I'm using another theorem. So I take this theorem and then I apply a modularity lifting theorem for a two dimensional Gauss representation. And if you combine those two, um, so I, I just want to use the Fontaine Mesa conjecture or something, right? Which, uh -huh. which you know in. In many cases, for, for these two-dimensional things. So you're right. Maybe, maybe I, maybe I don't really need. Um, maybe I don't need F to start with, but sort of. Then yeah. just combine this modulated thing with, mm, with another yeah, modulated yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, that's really that. Yeah, okay. But but in general, if 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 there's. Uh, for the higher dimension, the higher dimensional color representation, if we only know that uh, the residual representation is not uh, irreducible, so uh, is that a very general automorphic living theorem or just kind of very restrictive? How do you mean? Sorry, let me. Can you just repeat the question, maybe? Oh, maybe I'm um, okay. My question may be too vague. I'm just thinking that uh, uh, what kind of current status of the automorphic lifting theorem for the Piatti Gallo representation, but uh, the residual representation is reducible. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, 
yeah, I don't know. I mean, for, for non yeah. outside the ordinary case, I think there are not many such theorems. Okay. And we just had sort of proved one in this particular setup that's adapted to a symmetric power functionality. Mm -hmm. But I think there's probably, you could try and write versions of this theorem for other kinds of, um, that you sort of replace symmetric power functionality with other kinds of functorial transfer. Um, so I imagine it would be possible to prove more theorems that look like this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, don't don't worry. I just cure asked. Yeah, that was a good question. Mm. But um, the, the 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 sort of way we prove this theorem is very closely it uses the fact that these that these n plus one dimensional representations are symmetric powers. So, you crucially use it. so if you took some other n plus one dimensional representation that was not a symmetric power of a two dimensional representation, we wouldn't be able to say anything about it using using these methods because it's the in some sense, um, it's a bit like this propagation in periodic, propagation in periodic families. I said we want to, in that case, we wanted to connect by a periodic family, two modular forms, and then propagate automatically. Here, you're you're again kind of connecting things, but you're um, connecting things inside a local deformation ring or this ring R infinity that usually appears in the Taylor Wilde method, and then oh. you're sort of propagating mm -hmm. automatically the symmetric power when you can when you can connect two two points inside the spectrum of that of that local deformation ring. So that's exactly why we have this sort of non-ordinary assumption here. That means that after making some phase change, these the sort of periodic Garrett citations here are going to lie on, on, on the same component of, of Gibson's deformation ring. Uh, and lying on that same irreducible component is, is giving us the, the kind of connectedness that allows us to propagate automorphic symmetric powers. Is P bigger than two here? No, no, we have to use, we want it to P equals two as well, because we need, if, otherwise, if an eigenform had supercuspidal ramification at two, then we would be stuck. Uh -huh. So yeah, we have to write it for P equals two as well. Luckily, Jack knows about much like lifting when P equals two. Doesn't this, um, like, uh, I'm imagining if, um, you're applying this to p equals two, then it seems like one would be able to find. A, well, one if if you have a modular form which for which you know, and power symmetric functoriality, then um, doesn't this theorem apply for p equals two because they're both trivial? Yeah. You, so you only have a trivial mod two representation if you um, obtain level one. Oh, 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 right, right. And the way this theorem is set up, actually, we need sort of we need big image of two dimensional representation. So we have this condition uh -huh. Uh -huh. because we are still using the, the sort of usual Taylor Wiles method for the two dimensional representation. Um, All right, do we have more questions? Thanks, 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 Jim. Very nice.